I'm going to bring up the fires. Welcome to the Clean Power Hour Live. Today is April 20th, 2023. I'm Tim Montague, your co-host. Hey, check out all of our content at cleanpowerhour.com. Give us a rating and a review on Apple and Spotify. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. But giving us a rating or telling a friend are the best things that you can do to let others know that we're busy speeding the energy transition week in, week out with two episodes. We bring you this live every Thursday at noon Eastern. Today's a special show. We have a very cool guest on large-scale solar O&M. We have a company called Carolina Solar Services with us. Their CEO, Zach Hobbs, is going to be joining us. And before I introduce my co-host, I want you all to know that the Clean Power Hour is brought to you by Chint Power Systems, otherwise known as CPS America, maker of North America's number one three-phase string inverter, with over six gigawatts shipped in the U.S. With a focus on commercial and utility-scale solar and energy storage, the company partners with customers to provide unparalleled performance and service. The CPS America product lineup includes three-phase string inverters from 25 kW to 275 kW, exceptional data communication and controls, and energy storage solutions. CPS America has offices in California, New Jersey, and Texas. Learn more at chintpowersystems.com. With that, I want to introduce the commercial solar guy, John Weaver, my co-host. Welcome to the show, John. Hey, Tim. John Weaver here. How are you, Tim? Uh, should we tell everybody that you uh, got a Fu Manchu instead of a uh, big beard? <laughs> I got a Fu Manchu. Yeah, you know, once in a while things happen and you have to shave part of your face off. But it's going <laughs> to come back. That's the good news. Yeah. Um, I, I do need to get a hair transplant like Elon Musk did. Because, man, he, he's got a full head of hair now. But if you look back in time, he did not. Uh, so I just need to drop 20K, apparently. And then I'll have uh, a full head of hair and a beard. Um, but... Did you see the rocket? Uh, th this is questions for both Zach and Tim. Did either of you watch the rocket launch this morning? For SpaceX. Yes, and 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 so there's there's a there's a few a few other headlines I forgot to mention. <laughs> We're going to talk about Starship and their RUD this morning, and the AI is coming for your solar farm. So we're going to talk about a little company called Dina Watts. But uh, did you did you catch it live, John? I caught the recording. I watched it live. I watched it live. It was cool. It looked yeah. like a big piece of metal just flipping in the sky, going over and over. Uh, and, um, you know, yeah, but it was so neat they to launched, watch. SpaceX launched the, what is known as the soup, um, sorry, Starship. So it's the super heavy booster and the Starship on top of it. And it got off the pad. It cleared the tower, which was the goal, but then it, uh, exploded at about minute six and the, and the, and it failed to separate. So, um, so anyway, that was it was a beautiful thing to see them actually launch that ginormous rocket. I mean, I think it has two times the thrust of the previous largest rocket or something insane like that. I mean, it's just massive. Um, so that thing is going to be the workhorse for uh, missions to the moon and missions to Mars, hopefully in our lifetime. So that'll be cool. Um, well, let's get into our special guest. Zach Hobbs is here. Welcome to the show, Zach. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, happy to be here. It's good to, good to be here. John and I could talk about SpaceX all day, but we'd, we'd really uh, love to learn a little more about Carolina Solar Services. How did you get into solar, and what is Carolina Solar Services, Zach? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I got a little nervous. I, I'm not up on my SpaceX, but I watched that <laughs> launch this morning, but um, that's pretty cool stuff they're doing. Well, yeah, thanks for having me on. So, um, yeah, a little bit about myself and Carolina Solar. I started the company in 2014, and we're based in Durham, North Carolina. Um, we're we're really focused mainly on on utility scale O and M. So we're not really tied to any sort of developer, asset owner, OEM, EPC. We're we're just kind of you know we live and die by providing good good quality service to our clients. Um, we take care of about 800 megawatts of solar out there. We're operating primarily in the southeast, kind of Virginia, the Carolinas, uh, a little bit of work in Florida. And then we've got a team of seven folks out in Oregon that, that service a pretty large portfolio out there. 
um, and one site in Washington State. So we're just trying to fill in the pieces uh, moving forward. But um, yeah, in addition to O&M, we also do a lot of, you know, being independent, we do a lot of owner's rep kind of work, um, do a lot of commissioning for EPCs, any sort of like specialized um, testing, inspection, we'll come in and do root cause analysis for insurance situations, things like that. Um, and then we're, you know, we'll provide white label services for some OEMs where, you know, our team will be, our technicians are factory trained and can get out there and, and do some warranty repairs or commissioning, things like that. So we were, we were saying in the pre-show that, uh, that North Carolina is a major <laughs> utility scale solar market why is that and um and what and what questions does john weaver have about that yeah i mean i'm an engineer so i can't get too deep into the policy side but as i understand it you know the the, the purpa rules for uh north carolina the purpa cap somewhere around i don't know maybe you know john uh, 2010 or 2012 it got raised up to, to five megawatts ac i think it was previously like one or two megawatts um, and then, you know, there's a few developers, uh, you know, some big names, everyone knows Strata and Cypress Creek that really started cranking out five megawatt AC um, QFs all over the state. And so we we're trying to figure out how many there, there, there are in the state. There's definitely several hundred of those size facilities. Um, uh, so that, that really created a, a real strong uh, solar hotbed in North Carolina. Yeah, according to New Project Media, there's five gigawatts of solar in North Carolina of utility scale. Um, that's a lot for a solar for, you know, anything outside of California. That's a lot. Yeah, I think we are a sleeper state and that kind of helped me, you know, I was, I was in definitely the right place at the right time and uh, helped us um, grow and, and become the company that we are get established. I think due to that, you know, kind of new market, we were a little bit off the big, big guys radar um obviously we're you know competing with them now so yeah it's a good market so a five megawatt ac project um what are the biggest challenges work efforts tasks what are the biggest things you have to deal with when you show up to these sites it's a good question so i think one of the things our team does really well uh is that triage and, and decision making, um, there's a lot of cost benefit analysis that goes on because obviously these sites are too small to have full time staff like the you know, big transmission interconnected sites will have technicians reporting there every day, but we don't have the, the budget to do that for these size facilities. So there's a lot of um, we have a really strong performance engineering team uh, that's doing a lot of cost benefit analysis, return on investment for, for our clients and saying, hey, you know, I know you got a couple strings down here, but we're going to get to it at our, you know, next scheduled PM, or we're going to hit it next time there's a high urgent need with a central inverter offline. So that's a lot of our discussions back and forth with clients. We like to, you know, we set out a rubric of, of kind of response levels. Obviously, you know, if a major portion of the whole site's offline, we're going to be there within 24 hours, no matter what. But it's it's really, you know tuning in the the right the right response level kind of wait until you've got a full day of work on a site before rolling a team uh, of technicians there so we try to be really really efficient with with how we operate that tell us about the the monitoring side of this how are you monitoring these projects or is it also energy or a, a mishmash of products for better or worse, you know, we're, we've got to take what's given to us. So yeah, Big Bulk is with also energy now with, with the consolidation they've done. Um, and then we still have a few few other platforms we like. We've installed some Dina Watts. Um, you know, I, I really like their, their system and, and then we put it where we needed some retrofits. Um, but yeah, our performance engineers are kind of platform agnostic and, you know, that cuts both ways. That's a lot of systems to log into and you know, some systems there's there's no DAS installed and we're logging directly into to devices and, and inverters to check things. But, you know, by and large, we're, we're really good at dealing with data and, and pulling data out, aggregating it, kind of doing some some weekly analysis to to, you know, get down to any sort of tracker level issues or, 
you know, underperformance at the buyer box level. That's interesting. My default reaction is you're a bunch of electricians running around with hard hats and tools, but you got performance engineers who might be engineers, um, but they're doing spreadsheets and they're doing wheel rolls and they're doing losses. And, you know, for myself as a generally a small commercial installer, the idea that you would leave a whole string down emotionally hurts me. Uh, I, you know, regularly we tell customers, hey, you have an optimizer down. We're going to leave that alone until we have three or four. But you're saying things like strings. It's like I have projects that are strings. And uh, so it's it's really interesting to hear that insight. And I've heard this before. You know, again, we, we will roll tires when – or we won't roll tires for one optimizer, for one module, but for a string. Um, that's really interesting. Um, you know, we're talking 20, 30, 40 modules that are – something's down not running so that's um that's cool you have people in in the office running a spreadsheet you have a calculation from the customer on the amount per kilowatt hour and you have some sort of estimation on what this thing is generating and what it's going to lose plus the cost to fix it all those things are in a spreadsheet somewhere i can fully visualize it so that's that's a that's a nuance i guess of doing commercial o m um that's not as conscious to most people so that's that's pretty neat uh neat thing there zach cool yeah i think one other maybe slight advantage we have is having multiple clients um we'll have you know there's there's regionality to these sites and so if we're at one client site and we see you know if our guys if it's one o'clock and they're done at that site and there's another site next door but there's a couple of low or medium punchless priority uh work tickets we can just swing by next door and pass along with cost savings of being in the neighborhood to knock that out for them. So yeah, we try to work pretty smart. When I start. think of, when I think of solar O and M, I think of, uh, you know, equipment failures like inverters or some glitch. Uh, so inverters go offline for some reason. And I think of trackers breaking, um, or otherwise going offline. I don't know if what, what expression you use for a tracker, not doing what it's supposed to do. But what are the what are the top three, I guess, issues that you are dealing with on a regular basis? That's a good question. So, I mean, by by and large, you know, probably 50 to 60 percent of our work tickets are DAS related, DAS or SCADA systems. So it's mm. either wow. or not, you know, we've got a cell signal that's not pushing its data out to to also energy like it should. Or we can't we can't log into a site. There's you know, we've we've found some clever ways to to put some um, remote relays in some of these DAS components so that you know we our performance engineering team can power cycle something from the office and usually you know that's the dirty little secret o and m right it's just like it turn it off turn it back on uh, but you know figuring out some of those smart solutions to you know save a truck roll there but you know there's quite a few um, issues that deal with telemetry and data and all that side of things to make sure we can have visibility but you know under that I, I think what you said about inverters is the biggest thing like we can live with a tracker row or two not tracking right um but if a you know if a two megawatt inverter is down we're, we're going to need to be getting getting parts in hand to to get that back up and running um so yeah you hit the nail on the head those are those are our major um you know urgent pain points that that we're rolling trucks for how often do you replace a module um uh like out in the out in the array yeah um that's a good question i mean I, we've probably got some good data on on failure metrics there you know we'll, we'll do typically we're, we're flying a, a uav a thermal uav drone once a year and if we you know it's, it's usually finding broken modules we'll do that a couple weeks before we're doing our big annual pm so we know hey let's throw a dozen modules on the truck for this site we got you know 10 are broken two have diode issues but it's really you know for the normal you know five megawatt site that might have twenty five thousand modules you know we're probably replacing 10 five to ten per year um it's pretty typical i gotta do some math here because i want to know what that percentage is because that sounds like a, a nice low so twenty five thousand two three yeah. so we're talking four that's hundreds four thousandths of a percent of the modules getting replaced annually that's uh that's pretty pretty interesting 
Um, well, you're assuming that 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 he's doing all, the O and M on all of the solar. Or what is? How are you doing your calculation, John? Oh, I just did ten divided by twenty-five thousand. Why twenty-five thousand? Because uh, Zach just said twenty-five thousand yeah. modules on a site. Oh, I think that's I a see. good ballpark number. Gotcha. Might, might be doing too much mental math at once, but somewhere around there. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, as we all know, modules are super reliable. Uh, yeah. It's not that they don't break. Okay, they do. Um, and uh, I had a question about your drone work. Are you doing all your own drone uh, flying? We do, yeah. So we have, we have a technician who's, who's our drone guru. He's, like, phenomenal. And this, this is all he does. He kind of takes care of, mm -hmm. of all of our drones and, and flies most days. You know, he's probably in the office doing report compilation and, and that sort of stuff a day a day a week and then a lot of our senior technicians kind of you know i'm we're big on training and and kind of you know cross training and things like that providing growth opportunities for technicians and so a lot of our senior technicians have gotten their, their commercial drone uh pilot's license which is obviously required to do this uh for pay uh, and so you know we'll ship out our our drone rig to to a region and, and let those guys, those technicians fly it themselves. Uh, so it's a it's an awesome tool. I'd much rather be doing that than getting inside combiner boxes and doing uh, curve tracing. A little safer flying a drone than going inside a combiner box. I yeah, guess. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, if anyone's put on the forty cal suit, they know it's it's no no fun. You know something you mentioned in the uh, in the in the pre the pre show when we spoke this morning was that. You know, a lot of solar sites are underperforming in the greater scheme of things. Yeah. There's a constant tug of war when in the run up to the construction of a solar project. The finance guys think that it can be done for less money and it's going to generate more pro profit. Right. And then the, 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 the equipment and construction side is going, hey, wait a minute here. Uh, you know, we, we, we can't build this for, for you know, uh, 30 cents a, a watt or whatever you've got in your financial model. Um, but, and, and, you know, in the, in, in the real world, corners do get cut sometimes, right? You sometimes use cheaper equipment than you should, or you use cheaper construction labor than you should. Mm -hmm. And those things come back to bite you. But how, what, what is the, what is the message you have for asset owners and developers when it comes to choice of equipment and, and, um, EPCs? Yeah, that's a that's a loaded question for sure. Yeah. I mean, there's there's, well, there's multi layers there. You don't have any skin in the game. You're not an EPC, right? That's you're right. Just, no, no, but I, I love complaining about them. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like the the you know the challenge I hear from any operations team, whether they're in house or, or third party. You know, I think there's there's clearly some climatic changes where you know our TMY3 data, or 8760 data, whatever we're using historically, it it's not you know, things are changing. Like, you know, when I was growing up, I was talking about this uh, the other day, like we didn't cut on our air conditioning until, until June. And now we're in, you know, we're here in, in April and it's, you know, it's pollen season and it's really hot. So there's just, there's definitely, you know, historical data, weather data it doesn't apply. And then there's all the little penny pitching or just kind of saying, hey, let's, instead of 1.3% losses, let's do 1% losses on this transformer all those little things that you can do to, to squeeze a little bit uh, extra production out of the model that the, the finance guys um, are doing. And then there's there's like real workmanship things out in the field. It's, it's um, you know, going with, with a top tier, you know, bankable um, inverter or tracking system. I get a little frustrated. I see a new tracker coming out every year that that's, you know, lighter and cheaper and could go on steeper slopes and and uh seeing a lot of uh r d done in the field with those first clients so we, we've had to replace our fair share of you know bushings and um you know slew gears and things like that um but in addition you know some of the things that you have control over during the the epc period is bringing in bringing in whoever the o m team is going to be or some sort of third party and they don't have to be an ie they they just need to be good technicians who who've seen how things fail um, and there's just little tiny details so you know i was walking a, a 50 megawatt site a, a month or two ago 
and you could tell one of the one of the laborers in the field doing field made connections was just way over tightening the gland on on the MC4 connectors. So you know those are going to be you know probably failed little seals and, and water ingress and possible ground faults in the future. So it's just having a really strong QAQC team uh, there while things are getting done, while all the subs are mobilized, they can go back and rework anything that needs to get done. But I, I really like to, you know, it's almost like, you know, I don't even need to charge for it. I just need to send out one of my really good senior technicians or regional managers to, to put eyes on things and provide some feedback during, during construction. Is, is wildlife a challenge? Are, are uh, you know, squirrels chewing through, through things and burrowing into things or birds nesting in problematic ways? Yeah, for sure. And we've seen that out west in Oregon. There's, there's a lot of uh, ground-dwelling rodents that'll, that'll take up residence. And, you know, the, it's softer dirt where there is a, you know, an electrical trench. And so they'll get in there and start chewing on wires and cause ground faults. And, you know, I've also seen you know, a lot of raccoons climbing poles and shorten out um, overhead equipment, you know, snakes inside transformers, um, <laughs> you know, ants, fire ant colonies growing up, uh, uh, you know, conduit and, and taking up residence in a combiner box. So, yeah, we've seen all sorts, all sorts of failures on that side of things. And we want to so, we want to talk about agrivoltaics, but John, uh, did, did you have a question queued up in your mind? I got about 18 questions that yeah, I'd like have, to ask. We have nine minutes, so uh, <laughs> pick, choose, pick and choose carefully. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to comment one thing that you said, which like kind of struck me, is you said the weather models aren't applicable anymore. And that's, on one hand, from a professional standpoint, that's like, oh, yes, good information. Thank you, Zach. As a human being who wants to live on this rock and not die, it's like, ah, shit. Um, I hope we're not... Well, no, we know what's happening. So it's just like, wow, right. that's um, that's a, 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 a visual into the real world that goes right through our industry. So I, mm -hmm. I thought that was interesting. Um, you know, I, I like, um, I, I'm a really big uh, fan of campfires and uh, going out into the woods and, you know, relaxing. But I'm sure you professionally hate fires. However, I've, I've read a little bit that there are a decent amount of fires on large scale projects you know, combiners, things sparking. How often do you have a fire event? Or um, they have them, they're, they're called heat events, or there's oh, there's yeah. good thermal events. There we go. See, now right, that's yeah. why we know you're a professional. Thermal that's right. Events. You gotta be yes. careful with the F word. Yeah. Yes, um, sorry. <laughs> it, is, it is like the only four letter word uh, yeah. in, our, in our office. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, I mean, for better or worse, we do encounter thermal events. Um, with with more regularity than i would prefer um generally you know they're 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 often like arc faults ground faults that are going to sit there and and kind of smolder or burn until the sun goes down and we've got some good tools to to go ahead and block out you know production on a whole string of modules so we can address that um you know once we get uh technicians to the site but yeah there's a lot of this is where a lot of the um you know, the, the annual preventive maintenance hopefully is catching this stuff, doing infrared imaging on combiner boxes, any field made connections, you know, going into your DC cabinet or AC cabinet and in, in the inverters and looking for anything that's not landed properly, or maybe there was, you know, they missed the last, you know, torquing the last lug on the right hand side because it was, you know, five o'clock on a Friday when they're installing it. So getting in there, we can catch a lot of those issues before they they become uh, thermal events. But, you know, I've, I've seen, man, I, I don't think I've seen every single component, maybe except for communications, like communications are pretty darn safe, you know, 48 volts and, and uh, fiber optic stuff, but um, everything else I've seen have a thermal on. event of some <laughs> sort or another. Uh, That's cool. So yeah, we're, we're good at dealing with that. Unfortunately. Speaking of, Speaking of drones, um, recently saw an announcement from Raptor Maps, mm -hmm. and there, and this is an idea. I think both Tim and I said we had a uh, had this idea a long time ago, but the idea that Raptor Maps is putting out is that there's going to be a permanent on-site drone. It's going to have a little launch box, and it's just going to 
What do you think about having a drone on site 24 seven running every day? Is this going to be information overload or do you think there will be incremental value that can be gained as you learn the art of the daily drone? I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in this on site 24 seven drone. I love it. I've been tracking that as well. And I've seen, you know, I've seen, obviously there's, there's solutions for construction sites doing material takeoffs or for, you know, progress uh, inspections or security inspections. But, you know, I definitely think it makes sense for a really large site. I would love that sort of solution for, you know, that we could put in the back of a pickup truck for our technicians. And that's just like, you know, the first thing they do when they roll on the site is get that baby going and then they can work on their JSA and safety plan and, and work plan for the day. And they get a real time report of like, hey, Something's going on in this part of the array. Let's go dig into it. Um, yeah, I don't think it would be information overload. We're there's some there's great software out there. There's a lot of different uh, folks offering good software to kind of pick through that and give you a nice orthographic of the whole site and where where those hot spots or broken models might be. Um, so I would I would love that. And and you you know, it sounds like you focus on the electrical maintenance, but do you do landscape maintenance as well? We do, yeah. That's always been, you know, probably a quarter of our business is is taking taking care of the grounds, and making sure that everything stays shade free, um, and you know, so we've we've done a lot of mechanical mowing. You know, I'm a little bit of a tree hugger, so I I'm, I kind of cringe with herbicide application, but we do have to do some some spraying, and and we try to do selective herbicides that that let the grass keep growing, so there's good uh, ground cover maintained. Um, but I also started uh, some grazing. I started a flock in 2016 with my brother-in-law, who's a veterinarian, and we're up to about uh, 250 ewes um, of sheep, um, and they they kind of help us grazing. They they just barely put a dent in the amount of work that we have, but it's a really nice value add for for some of our clients who care about that and um, reduces our workload that we have to do. And does the array have to be designed? explicitly to be sheep friendly from the get-go or can they can they be retrofitted into an array so to speak yeah i mean all pretty much all the facilities where we graze sheep they they weren't designed for sheep so we we typically come in you know the season before that we're looking at putting sheep on a site and we'll have to firm up the uh yeah go sheep i like it uh we'll have to firm up the the fence integrity you know the biggest the biggest hazard um our our domestic dogs so they'll they'll get in and they'll you know we've had this happen once unfortunately but they'll you know kind of for sport try to try to kill sheep so um mm. it's really any of those spots in the fence that are too low otherwise with the size sites we're we're working on we'll sometimes subdivide it so we can mob graze really heavily have a high grazing intensity and we're trucking water to the site so we don't have any sites large enough where it makes sense for us to to dig a well um but we can, you know, I think good good grazers who know what the sheep need and, and know what potential safety hazards are for, for their flock can can make a site work for them. Yeah, I've learned that access to water is one of the uh, one of the keys, right? You gotta have water for the sheep. Of course they're getting water by, by grazing, but they need extra water also. And and of course that's climate specific and and weather specific. Um, That's exactly right. Anything else about agrivol takes you wanna highlight? We've just got a couple minutes with you left here. Yeah, I'll, I'll put a plug out there. I mean, this is one of my my uh, uh, hopes in the world is like, you know, I think there is definitely there's carbon sequestration value when you have rotationally grazed uh, land. And so I think, you know, there is always, you know, there's it's costly to, to manage a flock responsibly. So it's not just, you know, sticking sheep out there and picking them up in a couple of months. Um, we're, we're out there, you know, usually every other day to check on them and make sure we have got everything going well. So I'm really curious how we can or pass along to the asset owners the the additional value of sequestering carbon through, you know, just manure getting incorporated back into the soil and increasing soil organic carbon content. I think that would be that would unlock a lot of value for our industry and then put a little financial incentive for asset owners to to seek out grazers and agrivoltaics. So for for EPCs and developers, <clears throat> uh, and I'm asking this for myself as well, um, when is 
I, and I think you hinted at it, but I wanted to hear it firmly. When is the best time to have you out there? Is it during the end of construction or is it during the post-construction project vetting? Um, might might it be even smarter to um, purchase you guys as the spot checkers of a project, uh, you know, tighten bolts? Because I, I hear the number one issue with projects is things that are loose as the wind blows on them over time, you know, yeah. uh, you know, where, where do we get, where do we take care of our projects the best so that our spreadsheets look real 10 years in, um, you know, I, I asking for myself. Yeah. Yeah. I like to get involved as early as possible. I mean, we, we provided feedback on technical specs, just like whatever you're given to your EPCs to bid on. So, just a few things about, you know, wire management or how you treat trenches. And then what what we're doing for a lot of our clients is, is usually just a, a monthly site walk during construction. So, you know, as, as sites are getting built, we'll, we'll send out one of our commissioning technicians or senior technicians out just to do a site walk, pick out things they see that they don't like, and then that can be incorporated and fixed on the spot and, and implemented. So I definitely think sooner rather than later is is easiest for everyone because once we if we come in you know at you know substantial completion when most of the subs are kind of like yeah we're done with our work here it's hard to implement those site-wide changes that might need to take place hmm. um so yeah earlier is better cool all right well we will say thank you very much zach hobbs ceo of carolina solar services for joining us today uh, where we welcome you back anytime. So let's stay in yeah. touch. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, John. Yeah, Zach, right. nice to meet you. Thanks. Yeah, likewise. Take care. All right, you take care. Well, thanks for uh, bringing Zach to the show, John. Really appreciate that. That was fun. And, yeah, we could have um, totally done another 30 minutes just asking O&M questions. Just, yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's true. We got some stories we want to cover, though. Of course, uh, of course. The AI like the is stories. coming for your solar array. You know, everyone is freaking out about chat GPT-4 and how it's going to steal jobs. Mm -hmm. um, it's an amazing writer. I don't know if you've tried it, John, but uh, I often now will rewrite stuff that I write uh, using chat GPT-4 as a, as a premium subscriber. But um, there's a little company that's in the news <laughs> this morning. I'm going to put this on screen called Dino Watts solar and this is a story in solar power world dino yep. watts receives accreditation for fourth gen digital twin benchmarking technology so what these guys do is they embed a digital twin in a uh, in a device this is this is the the monitor or the weather station that just clips on to the solar array and then there's a uh, a box with a computer in it not far away that talks to this via uh, via radio and it's you know it's clocking what's going on with the array day in and day out and then comparing it to a digital twin of the solar array in a in a model in a computer and and then telling the end user uh, the asset owner hey your arrays performing peachy keen or hey we're we're, we're underperforming for some reason Maybe it's dust, maybe you need to clean your array, or maybe there's a broken string, a short somewhere, and you should probably get out there with Zach Hobbs and company. Um, but the, the, the real story here is that they're, uh, they've got a DNV technical review letter out now, and they're giving a webinar on May 4th. So check out this story in Solar Power World. Just search on Dino Watts, D E N O. Sorry, D E N O W A T T S, or go to dinawatts.com, their website. Here's the webinar landing page capacity testing with Dina Watts. So you can do capacity testing of your solar projects. And, um, and he's going to talk. Dan Leary is giving the webinar. He's the founder and going to talk about this DNV technical review. Any questions about this, John? um zach mentioned dino watts so i guess uh he knows them i i think yes. it's uh interesting because now as a small time epc we're having o m responsibilities and you know i have one customer who has a 10 year old project and that 10 year old project has uh 
uh, an old inverter on it. It's actually 12 years. It's a s- Solyndra project. And he gets wow. emails uh, regularly. Not, not, not inverters, though. Solar panels. Yeah, Solyndra, Solyndra in- modules. The, in- the inverter, the company's out of business. Uh, uh-huh. Starts with the letter S. Uh, they went out uh-huh. of business like right away. Both the module manufacturer and the inverter manufacturer went out of business a year after this system was installed. But yeah. the system's still running. The negative is, though, that the system says, hey, production is down. But then you're in New England. And we don't have a tool set up here that say, hey, the production is down. However, locally, 50 other systems have the same. So it's something to learn. Um, the customer is going to be using also energy for monitoring. So I hope also energy offers that ability to compare to other local projects so you can see whether your emails are worth it. Um, but I, I, this is interesting gear. Um, just you know, knowing what's going on at the site, what should be. And you know what? Our... Your Facebook user, Robert, said it perfectly. Um, it'd be nice to have a cost modeler in the software saying how much you're losing an hour or day. And that's similar to what um, Zach just said. He, he, they have a financial model guy. They have a, a, um, an, a something engineer, a production engineer, an efficiency engineer who's looking at the spreadsheet and the cost of turn tires. And so if you, if you have a piece of hardware that's on site measuring the real sun, you have a model that's next to it, you're then gonna have a difference between the two. And that's gonna be generation. You throw a spreadsheet on top of that, which apparently people have, and now you know dollars that are actually being lost. And that's, you know, that's cool. I wonder how much one of these units cost, how much it costs to install, um, what extra gear is necessary. I guess nowadays we could do a, a cellular modem and it wouldn't be that expensive to hook one up to get the data out maybe just run a wire straight to the inverter and the on-site DAS as it is so that seems a pretty cool piece of gear yeah it's it's very high tech and very affordable um, but I would just encourage our listeners to check out the webinar to learn more about that and there's also some some demos on uh, demo videos on their website dinawatts.com yeah. Let's move on and yeah. uh, talk about the AgriSolar Clearinghouse. They have launched a policy guide that I haven't read this yet, but uh, we're going to have Stacy Peterson on the show, probably a one-on-one pre-recorded interview. But um, check out the AgriSolar Clearinghouse. I get this on screen here for us and. So this is a, uh, a, an organization that is mostly funded through the DOE, and it's a nonprofit, but they got an amazing website. Uh, we've talked about it. It's been a while, but anyway, this policy guide just came out, and as you can see, they're covering existing state-level initiatives, county-level agrisolar regulation comparisons, summary of local land use code analysis. I mean, this is really down in the weeds on aspects of, you know, permitting, vegetation management, fencing, screening, decommissioning, et cetera, et cetera. So this is very comprehensive and I'm excited to, uh, to bring Stacy on the show. You know, John, everywhere you go, you see agrisolar or agrivoltaics in the news now like it's really taking off in the u.s i mean you you heard zach talking about getting into it himself with a flock of sheep um i guess it helps to have a veterinarian as a uh, as an in-law but uh <laughs> um yeah agrisolar it's it's a uh, aka dual use solar right you you can grow crops you can grow grass for grazing and um and you're you're doing a you're doing an agrivoltaics project with the uh, Agri Solar Consulting Group, right? We're at the very front end of it. We're working on our one line diagram so we can submit to the utility. I don't want to say we're actually doing an agro project yet, because really we're doing an interconnection project first. If we get interconnection, then we'll be doing some agrivoltaics. But yes, we're chasing right. on it. Um, I'm also I'm also going to put in an application to Mr. Uh, Jagar Shah uh, and the Department of Energy. And I'm working on it with, a, or I haven't started on it, just exploring it, but I'm gonna try and start an agrivoltaics focused company whose specific goal is to build community solar sized 
agrivoltaic facilities, and they're just going to be super hardcore focused on that. I think we need a, a good structural engineer who's going to be able to design racking systems really well. We're going to need a good civil um, sales guy. And, you know, so I'm, you know, we're only at four, five percent of our electricity from solar. And while a minimal percent, trivial percent, has any sort of agrivoltaic uh, aspects, um, you know, sheep, pollinator, or proper crops, you know, minimal percent. But we got 10x to grow. We're going to go from 5% to like 40 to 50% of our grid. And the amount of electricity is going to increase. So we're going to grow 10x. Within that period, if only a tiny subset is agrivoltaic, it's still going to be a huge volume. And it's just going to be good for us to have. So I, I don't know. I like the idea of it. I want to be able to sell it. I think for a smaller company like uh, Commercial Solar Guy, projects that are you know, 20 to 50 acres of agrivoltaics might fit within our wheelhouse. So I'm going to push on it. I'm going to ask the uh, Department of Energy for a loan to help us start this up. So that's that's going to slowly come. Um, so, yeah, I, I like agrivoltaics big time. Good stuff. Yeah. What's what's not to like? Um, yeah. And and there are markets, you know, New Jersey, Massachusetts, where there are big advantages to doing agro agrisolar often you can't do ground mount if uh, you're dealing with farmland, right? Because there's very, they want to protect the farmland, which makes sense in, in these places where it's, uh, it's, it's more of a, uh, of a premium, so to speak. Here in the Midwest, I'm, uh, you know, we, there is agrivoltaics going on. There's, there's more pollinator friendly going on and we will see, it's just TBD. I am working with a farmer who's uh, keen on agrivoltaics, and uh, you know we're just we're we're in the education phase uh, and trying to figure out again like interconnection is a big one, um, and then and then the economics and um, but that was good to hear that you can retrofit sheep into an you know a, uh, an array that's not designed necessarily for agrivoltaics. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to show this uh, this clip of the Starship uh, taking off this morning. Starship took off and did an RUD, uh, <laughs> which was, I think, frankly anticipated. Um, halfway, it was halfway anticipated. They they were very conscious that it would be a uh, risky flight, and technically, when you say RU, I mean. I'm guessing they manually exploded the unit via somebody who has a finger on a switch. Uh, and so they, you know, they made their choice and said, all right, we got to blow this guy up because it's spinning. Um, but it got up pretty high. And, and you know, it's neat. Uh, engines started going out. If you look at that little image in the lower left, you can see that there's three engines that are out. And you can right. actually tell once it's when they show you a video camera from behind. Yeah. But then as the unit continued on, one or two engines went out more. Because I believe by the time the end of it, there were five engines that were out. So I thought that was interesting to watch. Uh, but but you said it in the uh, early on in the show that this unit is twice as much thrust as... Oh, there it is. There you can see it. You, so you can, you can see all the little the yep. dots where there's holes. Um, but twice as much thrust as the most powerful rocket prior. I'm guessing that that's the Saturn V rocket. I think that's from, right. Yeah. And I've been to the Saturn V rocket, uh, or at least one of them, in uh, Cape Canaveral, I believe, as a little kid. And it just you just walk and walk and walk. It's like a football field or something. <laughs> I mean, it's and it's yeah. laying on its side. It's, I mean, of course, we were little tiny kids, so everything's giant. But laying on its side, it's a building or too tall or something like that it's just this huge beautiful thing i i think this is cool i love the fact that people are going to vacation to watch a rocket when we were little kids we used to drive up to cape canaveral every once in a while for shuttle launches or even shuttle landings because you can watch it just kind of glide in and then boom, boom you hear the big uh uh the sonic boom as the unit just you know breaks whatever speed so yeah here's where the unit I'm guessing at this point they were expecting, once it started to roll, they were expecting to do a separation. 
and then both units would roll into the ocean or uh, their thing but I'm guessing here is where they're seeing that there was no separation um, that was occurring and and I don't know why but yeah. well I'm sure we might hear they're not super open but now you can kind of see a rocket tumbling to some degree maybe they were pushing yeah, the rocket it. gets out of control uh, not sure if they know why that happened but uh, and then Kablooey. Kablooey. Um it just goes boom um, and yeah I don't know if that was somebody pushing a button or it spontaneously uh, going boom so well, there it was that's the first goodbye. one goodbye starship yeah but for for fully stacked right first time they fully stacked um, the super heavy and starship and you know clearing the tower was a major hurdle so there this is this is considered significant progress pretty cool pretty cool. alrighty what do you want to talk about next Tesla uh I you know what what would be cool we could talk about Tesla um so so I, I've written, I happen to have written like three articles on Tesla in the, in the last week or so. But yesterday I covered, or this morning I covered their quarterly earnings. And the article you're about to click on isn't about their earnings. It's about something else. But this morning they announced that their energy storage shipments year over year from the prior first quarter. So first quarter 22, mm -hmm. they're up 360%. And they shipped 3.8-ish uh, gigawatt hours. This is 100% all this growth from like one gigawatt hour per quarter is from the new mega factory facility that's in Lathrop, Lathrop, California. Lathrop, and yeah. Lathrop. And that facility does nothing but build mega packs, which are each 3.9 uh, megawatt hours. So that was neat. Um, uh, another thing that I covered on Tesla recently is that they put out their uh master plan number three and it was in general it was very interesting their data their estimations um one thing that i thought very interesting was each mega factory which generates 40 gigawatt hours per year if you had a hundred of them roughly you'd be able to make enough energy storage to run the grid and uh, to do everything we need for the grid and now Tesla has two out of a hundred. Um, but what's interesting is Tesla is not going to be the only battery company. However, each 40 gigawatt hour mega pack is one one hundredth of the global need of energy storage for the grid, at least per Tesla's estimations. And I just thought that was kind of neat that each one of these mega factories is one one hundredth. It's just a nice little clean equation of a uh, boop. There's another percent boom there's another percent and if we get to a hundred of these we could back up the world for 24 hours so i don't i don't follow though it says tesla's energy storage business will have experienced great greater than 1000 percent growth from 2022 mm -hmm. this is looking forward so if we say that in 2022, they deployed about six and a half gigawatt hours, then we look at say 2025. So you got to scroll up a tiny bit and we, so those, that paragraph right there, should the Lathrop and Shanghai facilities, that's their new mega factory, both get anywhere near their 40 gigawatt hour by the end of 24 and 25, then in the year 25, they're going to deploy like 70 gigawatt hours and okay. uh that's a huge amount gotcha and so that's what they're moving toward and so the year over year though that tesla experienced in storage was the year over year growth was what 360 percent wow yeah yeah because because last year first quarter yeah the 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 story i just put up covering their quarterly numbers just uh we we just posted it on uh pv mag so in uh in Q1 22, they booked 846 megawatt hours. 
mm-hmm. they just now did 3.89. So that's where they get that 360, a little more than four four x growth. Um, okay. And that's just you know one facility. So we we should expect to see next quarter. I I don't know because they're ramping up and and there's a nuance with how they can book a battery because you can't say we manufactured it. It has to do with when the project is deployed and when the money comes in and other dynamics. So so maybe we'll see sluggish uh, bookings, but even though volume is already ramping in the back end, and so by the time we get to the fourth quarter, maybe we'll see the big yeah. volume hit, and I don't know. So it's we're in the midst of a, of a big energy storage utility scale scaling. And we know this, of course, being in the industry, but we're literally watching it with these factories right now. And so that's super interesting to me is watching these two Tesla mega factories start to grow. Yep. And in a related story, CATL, you call them cattle. I call them CATL. I don't know what's correct. Uh, I mean, CATL is an acronym, but... Um, What's the story with CATL? Something about condensed matter. It sounds very high tech. Um, <laughs> I, I hope it's Star Trek. It, <laughs> you know, what? I'm just gonna lie. Yes, Timothy, this is <laughs> without a doubt Star Trek. Uh, they're building a spaceship. We're all invited. Um, this is a battery that has 500 watt hours per kilogram of density. Wow. And that's a lot. And, that's more than double what's Isn't in standard lithium technology like 220. Uh, that's that's more yeah that's it's like low 200s that are in our Teslas, and uh, so this is more than double of it. They said it specifically. They they specifically noted it's for airplanes, mm. for flying, and so yeah. apparently it's going to be an expensive battery initially, <clears throat> and it's 500 watt hours. So that was the thing that interested me the most. Today, we can buy a car with 200 plus, 250. We can drive 250, maybe 300 miles. If you're going downhill a little bit, AC is off, everything's perfect. Um, this would put a car easily over 500 miles. Um, so the story and, is titled, China's CATL unveils condensed matter battery to power civil aircraft. This is on Reuters. And if you're curious what CATL stands for, it's Contemporary Amperex Technology Company Limited, CATL. It is a Chinese company. Yes. Um, but, uh, but they're like the number one manufacturer of lithium-ion cells. They're expanded into sodium technology. I saw Jigger Shaw posted a story about their sodium technology, which is knocking on the door of lithium-ion in terms of energy density. Uh, it's very close. It's, it's it's at like 80, 90 percent, I think now. Hmm. So uh, they're they're you know these guys are really pushing the boundaries of next gen storage. It's really cool. Yeah, yeah. There, uh, I believe that the Shanghai Mega Factory has an agreement with Catel C A T L Contemporary Amperex Technology with uh, uh, to offer the battery cells to the Chinese mega factory. So, I mean, this is, if you want to be connected with a company, this is it. If you're making battery cells. Yeah. So I, I just thought that was awesome. And I think CATL is looking at propping up a factory in the U S I can't remember if that's true or not, but I, it is. I, so, yeah, I so they had an, in the news recently. Yeah. They had an agreement. There's actually a lot of politics surrounding this. Cause this is a leading Chinese manufacturer of one of the leading future project yeah. products. Yeah. But, uh, they were initially, CATL was going to sign an agreement with Ford to deploy a facility in North Carolina. But the North Carolina governor said he didn't want communist China having a back door into North Carolina. And so he killed the deal. Mm. Now, CATL and Ford announced that they were going to do the facility in Michigan, close to yeah. Detroit. Makes good sense. However, there are people on the ground, locals, who say, hey, we don't want to be nearby a factory that's communist China. So it's really interesting how the politics have wound into our manufacturing and, you know, this type of stuff. So, yeah. Well, Complex. the Chinese market is so mature that apparently 
solar is sexy and you can get a better wife if you install solar on your uh, on your on your home. So uh, I, th I thought this was quite quite uh, amusing, and I'll put this on screen. Uh, Luz Ding uh, tweeted this story, and the poster says the poster, which is targeting younger villagers, reads: yep. "Install solar earlier, get a better wife." Um, and and it shows a uh, obviously very attractive young lady um, who's about to be shown. Welcome home, honey. I guess I don't know. <laughs> So China has deployed a massive volume of distributed solar. And this thread is actually a very nice one if you wanted to, you know, just read it on your own. Um, because the uh, reporter here, she works for Bloomberg. She went through how China, you know, what their ways of deploying distributed solar are. And it's, it was first off, it was eye-opening. It's like, cool, great techniques. And, and then it also gives you insight into, you know, China is a large, complex country country and they they are not um uh they are not uh you know just some random little group trying to deploy some modules they got 1.4 billion people that they're trying to get product to and and it's it's just cool and so uh i love the idea that uh the marketing pushed that way i don't know i just thought that was cute so so yep. i'm a my girl, the girlfriend is, she thinks I'm totally cute because of my solar panel. So I think it worked for me too. There you go. There you go. John Weaver is hot because of solar. Um, well, yeah, our challenge, uh, our challenges are different than the Chinese market. We're, uh, we're a much smaller market. China's market is more than 2x what the U.S. is in terms of their annual installations. But... Um, Five Canary X. Media. Canary Media wrote a, uh, a story about one of the challenges we face, which is the backlog when it comes to interconnection interconnection queues, and um, we Canary Media concluded that we have, and this is Eric Wessoff and Maria Virginia Olano. Uh, the, the story is called "Chart: U.S. Clean Energy Backlog Balloons." to unprecedented two terawatts. And so, um, as you and I know, John, interconnection is a challenge, even with a small project. Yeah. And, um, but with a big project, you can imagine that it takes a long time. It takes too long. Uh, I've, you know, I've, I've talked to developers working in MISO, for example, which is uh, here in the Midwest, and it can take three plus years to get a utility scale project interconnected. And that's just getting the agreement, right, from the utility. And, you know, it's it's a problem, right? Because we, we everyone is basically ready to roll and make the energy transition happen. We've got the technology, we're building the workforce, we've got great legislation in the IRA, right? There's this perfect storm happening, but it has to all work in concert and the utilities and the IO and the uh, ISOs don't always work in concert. They're, they're very stodgy and pushback and yeah, they're, uh, they have a lot of responsibility. Okay. They, 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 they're here to make sure the grid is safe and reliable, but it's gotta, it's gotta change. Right. I, 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 this, this is what makes me lose sleep at night and pull my hair out. Which is why I need a hair transplant. <laughs> yeah, um, we we have the land, we have the um, we have the developers, we have everything necessary to deploy the clean energy facilities we need. Uh, we have to be patient as we do it over the next decade or two because we can't just dump a bunch of solar and close everything else. And we're going to get through this. We just have Didn't to push PJM on it hard. Didn't PJM put everything on hold for two years? Isn't that yes. going on still? And it hurts, man. It hurts. It's, oh. PJM yes. is the largest, in case you're wondering, it's the largest ISO from in terms of the population that it covers in the U.S. Mm -hmm. yes. And, you know, it covers a huge swath of the Northeast and then over to Northern Illinois, strangely. Um, that's a relic of, of Tom Edison having a an outpost in, in Chicago and wanting it to be connected to uh, his, his work out east. That's cool. But, uh, but this chart on screen here 
shows that Texas is the number one state in terms of new development. And um, this is interconnection Q in gigawatts, right? Look at that chart. It's just massive. And the storage is almost as big. There's 85 gigawatts of storage in Texas in the Q, 121 gigawatts of solar. Uh, that's that's more than 2x what California has in solar in the queue, right? So Texas has just zoomed past California. Um, and then Arizona's a beast here too. 86 yeah. gigawatts of, of, store, of solar, 84 of storage. So you see in these major markets how storage is now surpassing solar, right? In California, storage is 2x what the solar... Uh, the forward-looking solar capacity is, look at that, 103 gigawatts of storage and 50 gigawatts of solar in California. Oregon, same thing, bigger storage, uh, more storage in the queue than in, than for solar. So s utility storage is really coming on strong, but we have interconnection challenges. We'll get it. We'll get it. Three, four, five, six, seven. Illinois is number eight for interconnection queues. Um, New York, number yeah. five. A lot of, lot of solar and storage and wind. Look at oh, all that sure. wind. 67 gigawatts of wind in New York State. Holy yep. moly. Yep. That is a lot of wind. Is that mostly offshore? All of it. Yeah. Almost all of it. Yeah, New York's coming this. on hard. We're watching. I'm watching New York. They're going to do, they might do 40. I mean, I, I watched a report on New York, and they were nearly 100 gigawatts of solar, uh, I believe, if I saw that report uh, itself, just 100 gigs of solar, before they get to the end um, in, like, 2050. And that's yeah. that's a huge volume. So New York's going to be a very good state. Uh, I'm trying to get the company ripping and rolling there um slowly and surely because it's just important pennsylvania is going to come on i know they're not on this list but pa will be will have a yeah. lot of nice volume too <clears throat> all right tim get ready to chop some trees down because when i drive across pennsylvania all i see is forest it's like i've never seen so much forest in my in my life when i drive across pennsylvania i mean of course it's it's a it's an industrial powerhouse too right some major mm -hmm. industrial cities like pittsburgh um which are coming back to life, hopefully, right, with, with all this solar storage, steel manufacturing for, for racking, et cetera, right? All right, we have uh, no more time for any more stories, John. We're out of time. So we're going to say <laughs> sayonara up to Commercial Solar Guy. How can our listeners find you, Mr. Commercial Solar Guy? Uh, best place is commercialsolarguy.com. Contact us tab and send us a message. Let us know what your needs are for solar power. We do uh, residential uh, via Whaling City Solar on the southeast coast of Mass. We do commercial construction in Mass and Rhode Island, a little bit in New York. And we're a developer, consultant nationwide. Uh, so commercialsolarguy.com. I'm also on Twitter, uh, Solar in Mass, and uh, on LinkedIn constantly uh, as Commercial Solar Guy, John Fitzgerald Weaver, and all kinds of stuff like that. So, Tim. How uh, which cleanpowerhour.com website should people go to to find you? Uh, you finally learned our URL. That's awesome. Yeah, man. It a only took slow. you three years. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, go to cleanpowerhour.com. Check out all of our content. We have all of our audio there, all of our videos. Check out our YouTube channel and uh, subscribe to the show. Give it a rating and a review on Apple and Spotify. That's how you can really help the show get more listeners. More listeners means faster energy transition, right? There is a correlation. We want people to go further faster, whether you're already a clean energy professional or getting into clean energy or don't even know that it's a thing and we could bring that to the real world, right? And we need a million electricians, John. We're crossing fingers that Finn Montague, my youngest son, will be uh, accepted to the IBEW, but we're, we're waiting... Ooh on pins and needles for the news on that. So we'll see. And with that, I will say thank you so much for listening. Robert Sturble and company, uh, we do this for you. So really, really appreciate you guys checking out the show and giving us ideas for guests. Um, 
we we love ideas for guests and and of course john and i are a fountain of ideas for guests as well but with that i will say let's grow solar and storage i'm tim monaghy take care john